Good day, adventuresses. I'm so excited today that I have Tegan Caniff with me. Um, she's going to tell us some amazing stories. Uh, she is a travel photographer specializing in wilderness lodges and horse safaris. Uh, she has an amazing story to tell us uh, about uh, some, some really fascinating horses. So welcome, Tegan. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's very exciting to be here. Well, it is. Um, so, you know, I say good morning from Canada. It's good, good evening in South Africa where you're located. So, you, you know, I'm just starting my day and, and you're uh, getting ready for bed. It's getting dark there. So um, yeah. <laughs> it, it is, I always, that's one thing about doing these podcasts with talking to women all over the world is, um, you know, I never thought I'd be asking, so what time zone are you in? <laughs> so we can tee up so we don't have to talk in the middle of the night for one of us. So it is, uh, it is always very interesting when I talk to people on the other side of the world. Um, so let's, um, let's get going. So if, can you tell me how your love, of, love affair with horses began? Oh. I have an aunt uh, who's very into horses. So I think it sort of ran in the family blood and just started riding when I was young, very, very young and uh, wanted to continue for the rest of my life, basically. I mean, I think when horses get into your life, you pretty much have them around forever. They just bring you so much happiness. So it was yeah, a childhood thing. And then um, slowly started photographing horses, which has become now the adult thing, which is quite a dream come true. Really enjoying where I'm at at the moment. Well, great. So now you, you specialize in uh, photography of, um, you know, you're, you're in the right part of the world to be, uh, there's some pretty spectacular wilderness Amazing. out there um, and, and horse safari. So, so tell me a little bit about, about the horse safaris and how that all works. Well, the horse safaris down the side of the world are so exciting. Um, so basically, uh, my mid twenties, I realized that I needed to start riding again properly, and um, I couldn't really lease because I was traveling too much with work. So I started doing horse safaris and uh, using it as a way to sort of exercise my creative license and be in the back of a horse and test my drone flying abilities, which were quite shocking at the time. So yeah, the the riding down this side of the world is so varied. I mean, in South Africa alone, we've got mountains and beaches, and we got little arid scapes and whatnot. So Within South Africa, there's places that you can go. And then we've also got Lesotho, which is inside South Africa, but a different country itself, which is just highlands and rocks and very um, iconic scenery. And then, you know, northern of us is Namibia, which we'll talk about just now. And obviously, I mean, the countries around us have such varied, dramatic landscapes and so many big game opportunities as well. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. And the horse safari industry here is just made up of some very special people who've been doing it for a long time, but have like a good network and repertoire between them. So yeah, it's been more than I thought, but it's continued. <laughs> it's been quite exciting. Now, specifically, you met uh, a mentor that you have. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit uh, about them? Um, so this is through Namibia for Safari Company, um, I think you're mentioning with the mentor. So the first big horse safari I did as a photographer was a Namibia Horse Safari Company and it had been a complete dream. I think everybody has this at the top of their bucket list to go racing across the Namibian desert and everybody hears so much about this wild camping and 10 days of rugged riding and I had to do it. So I managed to get onto their wild horses safari ride. Um, and through that ride, met Talani, Dr. Talani Grayling. And she is um, a guide at Namibia Horse Safari Company, but she also specializes in uh, researching the wild horses at Aus, which this specific trail ends at. Um, so through the, the ride, she told us stories of these horses and really captured my imagination because I'd heard about them before, but obviously had never seen them um, being in a different country. and people go travel to Namibia just to see these horses. So I was excited to see them, but at the same time, quite concerned because the story she was saying about the drought conditions and her hyena predation meant that the horses were in a bad state. So yeah, that's how I met Talani, who is very unassuming and very humble and very quiet, but has a wealth of knowledge and is just a, a lovely person to know. 
It's always interesting when you when you meet those people that really change change your life. You know, it's it they they open a door or or a chapter in your life that you you didn't know existed, and then all of a sudden it it just you know it's like driving down the road and do I turn left or turn right and 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 they help guide you that way. Um, so now you've been working uh, on on promoting the 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 dangers of losing these horses. So tell me a little yeah. bit more about that. Well, when I first started working with them, um, well, with the Wild Horse Foundation specifically, the horses were going through um, a drought period of about I think it was about five years to six years at the time, which meant that there was no grass, and the foundation had had to step in with feeding programs. Um, but at the same time, there was quite excessive hyena predation. Um, and hyenas are native to the area and they're meant to be there. So some predation is normal, but because the horses were in such a bad condition um, and the foals were sort of being picked off before they could be replenished, it was becoming quite concerning. And I think they lost something like 100 horses over the space of a year. So that was, was quite shocking to me, especially because like hyenas they are very, very, very clever creatures. And uh, they do have prey that is natural, like the hemp's book or the ostriches, but they were specifically targeting these horses and learning how to hunt them and bring them down and they'd become their prey of choice. So when I heard all of that, I was like, oh, wow, people need to know something about this because the horses are quite important to the area. They're the only source of tourism for specifically ours and um, a lot of international and national from South Africa tourists specifically go up to literates and else in that direction to go and see these sort of desert adapted iconic horses. So yeah, that was the starting point of getting involved with them. Um, since then, the hyena predation has abated. The hyenas are relocated. Um, so that has luckily drawn to a conclusion that happened earlier last year. I think finally they got enough media pressure and the public pushed pressure on the government and there's a big push to to get that sorted sorted and resolved. Um, so yeah, that's that's now concluded. But the next thing is still the drought. So we've had temporary rains and some rains, and now this year has been tough again with no rains and obviously COVID coming in and making life more difficult for everyone involved. So yeah, so that's where we stand at the moment. Okay, well that's that. You know, it, it it's so. Um... You know the the circle of life essentially is you know we can't can't get away from that but it does break my heart that you know that they go after the very young or the very old and and it is you know with all animals you do see that cycle but uh, you hope that um like you said media pressure and and the um you know the publicity on it that it'll really you know help them and and it's great that they've been able to you know, move the hyenas and, you know, give them a, at least a fighting chance, you know, the poor, the poor little foals, you know, they, you know, they're, I, I just learned, I just was born today. I, I don't know how to run That's yet. Good. No, they'd be day old, a couple days old. And it was quite heartbreaking because they're quite curious uh, when foals are born. I mean, the, the adult horses sort of tend to move around you and not really a, sort of engage with you, but the foals would come up to you and try and like, to your tackies and knock your tripod stand over and <laughs> you're just at the back of your mind are like please don't be taken tonight and the next morning you'd see them you'd be like yes they're still there <laughs> so it is the part of you that you have to really put on ice in a way like you as as you said it is the circle of life these things happen um, and you've got to remove yourself from it but it's always wonderful when you see them out there still <laughs> <And> the <laughs> next morning yeah they're we're, we're all alike we want to see that we want to see them, them. <laughs> <laughs> that's right now you've worked with horses in in quite a few different countries on different continents um tell us about some of your adventures um yeah so i've been very very fortunate in the last year this beginning of this year actually to go through to argentina which was with los potreros which was amazing i was there for almost three weeks i was there for so long it was the last big travel stint before coming back to south africa and realizing that the world is sort of borders are closed and uh, that was really incredible it's a fantastic place to ride in the sense that like big open spaces and traditional herding and the criollo horses and the 
Peruvian pasos, which make you feel like you're just the most fantastic rider ever because they're just sort of whatever they do that little like tolting thing. I don't know the mm -hmm. triple gate. <laughs> well, they're supposed know. to be so smooth that you could yeah, hold a, a teacup on them and not drop anything. So yeah, well, in my can would be like a, like a camera in one hand and the reins in the other. And you're just like, well, I'll just gradually go up here and take a photo. <laughs> so that was really fun. And then um, yeah, Mongolia was supposed to happen this year, but will be postponed next year hopefully, um, and slowly working my way around the bucket list of dream locations as well, but uh, mainly Southern and Eastern African based at the moment. Right. So now, while now do you travel specifically by yourself or do you have a, a, a little tribe of uh, other ladies that are interested in same adventures? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is one of the things like uh, with horse safaris, you tend to meet such fantastic people, um, just friends and different worlds, different lifestyles to you in different countries. And you want to meet up with them and you want to do rides together all over. So I do have a, a small group that, you know, we tend to sort of see each other on certain trails. And I do have friends that I try and rope into different trips with me. Um, the aunt that I mentioned earlier on um, in the conversation, I managed because she, she originally got me into Peru back in the day when I was about 18 and that just opened my eyes to um, yeah to what a horse trail was like what it could be so recently we managed to do the wild coast horse trail together that was very fun and then other than that um, I sometimes ride with um, a girl called Emma Finney who does online web design and she's also a really avid horse rider so I tend to team up and do horse safaris together. Oh fun. So yeah, I do love traveling with someone but very often it's just not possible and it's just not financially viable for people to support so try and work in where I can and you know also share the experience where it's possible. Well and and you know you you said it very clearly when you said that the um, you know, it's like minded people, you get on these rides, and then you make new yeah. friends and your, your, your riding tribe grows and oh, where are we going next? And oh, well, I want to yeah. go to Iceland, I want to go to Peru. And all of yeah. a sudden, you, you know, you have all these friends, and I'm sure you have a group chat that, you know, every couple of days, a new place, oh, what about this one? And <laughs> is COVID ever going to end so we can go riding yeah. again together? Yeah. And after a trail ends in the WhatsApp group and just spammed with photos of everyone on the trail, <laughs> like hundred photos. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, now, now for, did you do any specific, um, like formal training for your photography or are you kind of self-taught? I'm largely self-taught and then I have had a commercial background. So when I first started doing photography, I used to do the traditional like events and weddings and commercial side. And then I realized I didn't like it. So <laughs> I moved into travel and moved into horses, which is sort of, I mean, it's a bit of a joke, really. I don't actually know how it's possible that I can combine horses and riding and, sorry, photography into it. So it's really been quite a, a pinnacle of, of childhood dreams in a sense. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been good to get to know this industry and see where it can lead and the people that are in it and those ridiculous experiences involved. Right. Now, do you have um, a, a favorite type of, um, you know, a favorite camera or do you use more of or multi multi cameras while you're riding or while you're taking photos? Um, so I use my Mark III, my Canon 5D Mark III. It's very, very durable. Um, I've had it fallen off horses before. I've had it uh, in saddlebags that have come loose and been kicked at a cancer and there's uh, yeah, and the drone, which has crashed three or four times. So, <laughs> um, so I ride with a 5D Mark, Mark III um, as my main camera, and then just a general purpose lens, which is the 24105. And that's pretty much the standard setup. Um, it gives me enough versatility to move around and zoom in and um, have a wide angle as well to show landscapes. Uh, yeah, and then I use a drone. I try not to use it too much because it can be a bit of a mission to set up and get going without like interfering with the group riding. So generally I sort of just gauge that and sometimes have to work ahead of the group or stay behind. And you also need a very good horse for that. So that's <laughs> definitely part of the gear package. <laughs> the horse is very responsive. Right. It's very nice, very patient. <laughs> Now, now circling back to, um, to these um, horses that, that you're so passionate about, um, why don't you give us the history on them? Okay, so there's two different um, stories about where the horses came from. 
Um, the specific details you'll find on the Wild Horse Foundation website. Uh, but the summary is that after the, or during the Second World War, they were abandoned. Uh, whether they were abandoned by the army troops that were stationed there um, and bombs went off and scattered the horses. There's pictures of the horses all picked in, picked in lines. And that's one of the theories is that they were scattered during a bomb raid. And the other is that they were left from a horse stud um, in Kabub. So there's two theories about where they came from, but they've been there for over 100 years. They were left completely on their own after the Second World War. And uh, they congregated around a water hole called Garib Station 1, which is a permanent water source. It was used, was used for the railways to um, sort of service the mining industry. So the horses have stayed there generations. Um, they've gone through periods of of huge numbers. I think the most were ever recorded was 286, and now down to 70, which is quite a vast difference, especially for the genetic pool, um, and are largely left completely on their own. Um, they have their own sort of uh, herd structures and behaviors and go drink water, and um, that's about the only human interaction that they actually have is the water hole, because uh, there's a viewing station there as well. But other than that, they uh, forage for food, they are completely wild, they are as untouched as possible, but they're also very habituated to humans. So that's also the, the, the pro, is that they, over the years that Dr. Talani has uh, spent working with them, they're completely used to humans. Um, like I said, they don't engage with you, but they'll just sort of do their natural thing while you're there. Um, so they have quite a specific background though, which you can see with the, the patterning of their, their coats. Um, and that sort of draws back to the, the stud origins or the military origins. Um, but they, they bear traces of Arabs and, and Hackney and Trachna breeds and different patterning that you can see in the same photographs from back in, you know, 1914 through to now. Hmm. So yeah, they've, they've formed their own sort of desert adapted breed in the sense over this period of time. So they're still relatively small type horses then? Yeah, they're about, fifth, net of, I don't know, about 14, 15 hands, I think. Okay. Um, maybe 14. <laughs> I don't know, it's been a while since I, in my mind, thought about that. But they, they're smallish. Um, oh. They're quite slim. They've got a lot more of that sort of like long legs, slim Arab torso. Um, but then, uh, yeah, they, they're stunning. They've got these like long dreadlock manes and long tails and when the wind blows it'll sweep to the side and no greys it's strictly bays and dark horses and uh, that oh. is one of the genetic things that has come through strongly there um, oh. and they have like a broken white pattern some of them on their backs which you can see through through some of the horses oh very interesting so what's one of the hardest things about for um, taking pictures of these horses well i think the hardest thing is just patience because they very often don't do anything besides just eat and walk and then eat and then walk. <laughs> and you're spending hours and hours with them out in the desert, um, hoping for some action. But then when action happens, it happens so quickly. So that's all the converse one. You've been sitting there for like an hour. You don't really have your camera ready and all of a sudden some stallions are going wild in the corner and having a huge fight. And then it's over as soon as you get your camera out. <laughs> so it's like you have to be on the state of like constant alert, but also, in standby mode, which it's a balance that in a way it almost becomes um, when you like meditative and like you're just focused on one thing, like when you're out there, there's nothing else besides just open space and what the horses are doing and what you're reacting with, which it's just a really good mental detox. It's like, while you're there, that's what you're doing. Right. And, you know, and patience, right? Number, number one. And, and I, I think when, when I think of horses, patience is still a word that always kind of comes to mind, but when dealing with wild, uh, you know, wild animals, um, you know, more so uh, than anything, because they are unpredictable. And like you said, you know, they, they start the fight and, and in typical male fashion, they have the fight. Okay. Yeah, fine. It's over. Mm -hmm. They punch each other and then they move on. Whereas I'm sure the mares hold grudges forever, like women. Um, so, what are some of the uh, hurdles that you you know while you know has there been storms while you've been out there or winds and? Yeah, this specific area in Namibia is known for its strong east winds. Um, so these east winds come over from the ocean and they blow in fog, but more often than not, it's just really strong blistering east winds. 
which you sometimes ride through when you're on the horse safari trails, which is interesting because then you've got these like bandanas and your horses are just going and you've got these rivulets of sand streaming your way. Um, but when you're photographing the wild horses in this, in this wind, it's pretty disastrous. You can't really do anything. Um, yeah, your camera and your tripod just, there's no videoing potential going on whatsoever. Everything's just super shaky. And you can sometimes photograph, but yeah, it's very hazy conditions and very intense. And then on the other hand, you can sometimes have beautiful, beautiful mornings where everything's crisp and clear. And um, Salani calls it the earth shadow, but when dawn rises and you can see the sort of darkened purple shadow over the horizon on the left-hand side of the, of the sun before it comes up. And like, that's just stunning to see. And the area out there is just really incredible. Um, Dick Fulham is the big iconic mountain in the area and it always catches the light and you sort of see the saturation coming down it and then you get these little horses underneath on the landscape. It so, makes it yeah, all worthwhile. Absolutely, absolutely. The conditions can be tough, but as you said, it's worthwhile. Um, so conditions can be a challenge. So, you know, and, and clearly the, the best part of, of it would be when you, you know, you get that perfect condition. Um, yes. Is there, you know, is there anything, you know, you know, the, the other best things about doing, you know, photogra photographing these animals? Sorry, say again? So uh, beside, you know, all of the, you know, the, the hard parts of it all, you know, the good parts of it all really come into, you know, being able to spend time with them. Is there, is there any, you know, what are some of your other highlights of spending time with them? It has to actually, I know I've mentioned her a lot, but it has to be spending time with Talani. Um, she's, she's just a very special person to know. Um, she, she's so in tune with the horses in the herd and she's just happy to be out there in complete silence and watching them and what goes on. And she'll fill you in with the, their most remarkable history of each horse and of their predecessors and their, you know, their great grandfather and what he used to do with his herd. And she has these, these tales of how, she has sort of known these horses over the years. So getting to know her in the space of where she's most comfortable, which is this place with just horses and just desert around her. She's not really a people person, she's an animal person. So it's been really special to get to know her as well, along with the horses. And uh, it always makes it a lot easier when she's out with me, because sometimes I have to go out by myself, and which is completely fine, but she's very good at predicting what's going to happen. And she's also another pair of eyes. So she'll be sitting there, casually talking to me or just relaxing and then all of a sudden she'll be like watch that horse over there something's going to happen and she'll sort of preempt and then I'm like okay <laughs> I'll face that way <laughs> so she makes my job a lot easier and um, it's also great company out there and uh, she she also quite enjoys being able to get out there now because um, you know generally life sort of takes its toll and you don't really get to spend the time that you can doing the things you love so she uses an excuse i think to also go out there and watch the sunsets and see the horses and count them and and yeah spend the it'll be very peaceful mm, incredibly peaceful and yeah very much so and it's just it, horses grazing around you and doing their thing now these horses, well, horses in general are very much creatures of habit. They have, you know, where they like to lay down, where they, you know, what certain things that they like to do. Do these horses fall into those same patterns, you know, yeah. always drink at a certain time, those kind of things? They do rotate a little bit, but generally they'll, they'll go where the grass is in a certain area and they'll sort of move like slightly clockwise or slightly anti-clockwise every day, just like a hundred meters or like a hundred meters. And then they'll work their way around the reserve, which is really huge. Um, and yeah, if there's no grass on one side, then they'll go completely to the other side where there's dunescapes, but mainly they'll stick to the same area and then gradually move around. And then during the day, the, yeah, the drinking times can change. Um, but they'll so usually drink early in the morning, just after the sun has come up, they'll start making their way and you'll see sort of the mares start pushing the herd forward and then all the horses sort of go and then, then they'll move off towards the, towards the water source. And you'll see the sort of stallions doing their herding thing where they're snaking their heads behind everyone to get them moving. So they do have patterns of when they go to drink, but it does change slightly each day. So in the beginning, you have to sort of just go there and see what's happening. So you don't know where the horse is going to be. You don't know what they're going to be doing. But like by the day four, day five, you kind of have a general idea of 
what time they're going to be going to the waterhole, when they're going to be crossing the dunes, just because you've spent the last few days watching them. Great. Um, what advice would you offer someone interested in, in traveling to see these wild horses? Well, my strongest advice would be absolutely do the horse trail through uh, Namibia Horse Safari Company. The wild horse trail is really just, it's beautiful. It's, um, yeah, if you like adventurous riding and if you like being able to see the stars at night from your camp roll and have fires going and good friends in the saddle um, and then the, the sort of scenery that you go through changes quite drastically and so you get to the end where you're crossing this big red dune section it's like a whole day of crossing and at the end of the day you sort of see the terrace mountains terraceburg which are close to ours it's on, so the horse is on one side of the terraceburg and then you come approach it from the other side when you're doing the horse trail and the, the purple terrace mountains are sort of over these salt white pans and they look like they're floating above my, like clouds it's really incredible to see as you're riding over these red dunes and then at the end of that you go see the horses um, when you are finished the trail so that would be the absolute prime way to go see them if if i was interested in horse riding and a good rider and keen to do the, you know the Namibian trails it would be that and other than that if you're if you're not so keen on doing quite a strenuous you know eight day trail eight to ten day trail then you can also just go visit them as a, a tourist and you can stay in a place uh, called plain house vista at, at us which is very strongly linked with the horses they've been a huge supporter of the horses over the years and are also part of the foundation the wild horse foundation so you can stay there and then the horses are about a couple kilometers away so there's there's various options um and generally tourists do actually get good sightings because when they go down to the waterhole that's where a lot of the action happens um, so often tourists get more than they bargain for because you know they don't really expect to just see horses come across the desert and then have a huge you know big fight or spat so it's quite a, a good viewing spot for for that as well well that's great i um you know i hadn't really thought that much about that area um you know being from uh, North America. I've really, you know, you, you've, we've, I've traveled to Europe um, and of, of course through North America, but I had never thought about going to see the wild horses of Namibia. Mm -hmm. So now I have another list, uh, another destination to add to my WhatsApp group chat. Um, hey, this is where we should go next. Um, now, um, obviously the, you know, the COVID this year in 2020 has really you know, put a, a halt to a lot of things. Um, has, has it affected uh, the wild horses at all with uh, funding or, uh, you know, have, has there just been less going on simply because of that? So there's definitely less tourists going through the area um, and that's a bit less support. Um, but from the foundation's point of view, not much has changed. They're still trying to raise donation money to feed the horses during this period of, of, no, of drought and no food. And there's very few people in the area as it is, because maybe it's so vast and unpopulated. So the actual engaging with the horses has stayed the same. They're still going out there and, and dropping off food and leaving it for the horses. But yeah, as a whole, the tourist industry has sort of seized as it mm -hmm. has everywhere. And everything that relies on it has also taken a little bit of an arc. Right. So now what's, um, besides, you know, looking after your craft of taking photos of these amazing horses, what's, uh, what's next on your list of things to do post COVID? Hmm. Things to do post COVID. Feels like I can't even start to dream about a world <laughs> where I can travel again. Um, I, so first on the agenda is to do a lot of work travel because this year I've done no work travel. So next year I'll have to be hustling hard and back to back work. Um, but I do really want to do Jordan. I think that is a country that has sort of captured my imagination. It's, a, it's in a similar sort of landscape view to Namibia, which I love. Um, there's just something so iconic about open lands and huge big mountains. So yeah, Jordan is on the cards and then next year Mongolia with the Gobi Desert Cup that just gets postponed. <laughs> so yeah, so two big things, but next year is a big open question mark. No solid plans as yet and just kind of wait to see it, like what the world offers. I, I do it's think that, that seems to be the, uh, the common denominator is 
Um, well, hopefully 2021 will will get better and, and you know, travel restrictions will lift and, and we'll be able to get back to a, I'm sure it'll be a new normal of what uh, what we can and cannot do. And, uh, but it is um, fingers crossed that, you know, we can, we'll get past this. I know we will, uh, just a matter of when, because yeah. we are impatient and we want to get traveling again, um, you know, though. Our, our horsey adventures have to have to continue. Um, Absolutely. So, so one, yeah. um, what I will do is add all of your uh, links to our show notes. Um, so we can definitely share more information on the wild horses of Namibia. Um, so if any, anyone else is interested in going to see them um, and be able to uh, experience even just a tidbit of what you've shared with us today. Um, now we always wrap up our interviews with some rapid fire questions to kind of get to get the uh, you know the inside scoop on our guests. Um, so you know first uh, first thing that kind of pops in your mind as we um, as I ask the question. So they're not too hard. You won't uh, won't be stumped hopefully. Um, so the first one is what's your must pack item on a trip? Oh, must pack item. Uh, definitely a riding like wide brim hat. Just have to you have to have a wide a good hat with you. Okay. Um, <laughs> that that's a I, I wasn't that wasn't the answer I was expecting. Um, are you a long term planner or a wing it style traveler? I'm a wing it style traveler, definitely. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> where do you want? Um, I'm going here. You want to come? Okay. <laughs> Yes, exactly. We're leaving tomorrow. <laughs> we got a space. <laughs> um, besides riding and traveling, what other hobbies do you have? Very interested in reading and hiking. Reading and hiking. Do you have a favorite author or style of reading? I'm quite into fantasy authors. So favorite author would be Patrick Rothfuss or any of the Wheel of Time books. Lord of the Rings, obviously. Oh. <laughs> <Sort of a laughs> <fantasy nerd. laughs> uh, what's your biggest addiction? Mm, sweet tooth of note ah. so yeah yeah bad <laughs> anything um are you an early bird or a night owl um when i'm traveling i'm an early bird when i'm at home i'm a night owl hmm. That's a bit of a twist. what's the strangest thing you've ever eaten guinea pig in peru i think Oh, I, I have heard that that's the, the popular item there. So, uh, and was it okay or? Fine. As they say, it tastes just like chicken. <laughs> don't, Isn't that, they, <laughs> don't they say that about everything? Oh, it, everything. it just tastes like chicken, snake, <laughs> yep. guinea pig, crocodile. <laughs> crocodile. <laughs> Not kangaroo though. That doesn't taste like chicken. No. Um, if you could spend one year paid, where, paid off, uh, where would you go? Probably Indonesia, Polynesia, Indonesia, anything of islands and beautiful clear waters and giant tropical forests. So then, which leads me to my next question, beach or mountain? Mm, definitely beach. <laughs> if it was <laughs> desert, I'd be hard pressed. This desert is the top one. Well, great. Well, thank you so much um, for, for chatting with me today, Tegan. Uh, you have a great story. Um, I'm so interested in doing some more research on these wild horses of Namibia. Um, you know, just the, the, the history behind it, you know, were they abandoned? How did they come? Um, and that, you know, that they're fighters and, you know, they're still around. We're going on, you know, 80, 90 years. Um, so, so it is something and, and wild horses do have a share, a, a soft spot in my heart that they, you know, that you know, how did they get there? And, you know, they're still able to, um, to manage even in, you know, like you said, a drought year or limited water or lots of predators. Um, so they are something that uh, we all should be caring about. Um, so thank you so much for, for chatting with me today. And I hope to chat with you again soon. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me and for letting me share the story of the wild horses.